My first question is, you were as a journalist in Kiev a few days ago, and why did you leave? Well, I left because um, it was clear that anybody not reporting the government line um, 100% could be in danger. Um, I was also working for a TV company, Press TV, which is seen as very anti-NATO. And um, I could quickly see that um, it could get dangerous for myself. Um, I've been deported and arrested before in, in the Middle East in Bahrain uh, for my reporting, and I know how quickly the net can close on certain figures. Um, a few days before I got there, the Ukrainian government banned 11 op opposition parties, uh, mainly left-wing parties. They banned, they took all the media companies into one government-run media organization. Um, so it's clear they're trying to suppress uh, small, small, small parties have been forbidden or 11 it was a it's 11 opposition parties mainly leftist parties so the main the main party they banned was the uh, opposition for life it's called which is is the only one of those parties that has members in the parliament and they're overwhelmingly from the east of the country from the the russian ethnic area of the country uh, but also various socialist left-wing organizations as well anybody deemed Uh, critical of of the government um, from that from that side. So and also seeing many of the videos, uh, there's a lot of videos going around of the torturing um, uh, of people who are seen to be not pro-government enough. There was a famous uh, ethnic Russian uh, martial arts sports figure video of him uh, being tortured, and he hasn't been heard of since. Uh, lots of videos in Ukraine of people being tied up around lampposts for, uh, we don't really know what crimes, thieving, perhaps speaking Russian, or being pro-Russian. There's so many um, videos of the, tor uh, the torture and, and of people s sympathetic to the Russian side. So for that reason, I could see how the Nets, after my first two interviews went live, and seeing how perhaps they could be construed as not being pro Ukraine government enough, I could see how the net could close. In the West, uh, Ukraine is presented as the forefront on, of democracy against autocratic regimes. That's not your experience. Well, I, I was aware of um, this Ukrainian government ever since 2014 um, has been a very nationalist government with important elements of the far-right, ultra-nationalist and, and neo-Nazis um, involved, and indeed in, in, in some parts in power. Um, to point to that, some, some Western news agencies have done a great job of highlighting, particularly the Nazi threat in Ukraine, the BBC, The Guardian, Time magazine, there's some fantastic short documentaries um, looking into the Nazi threat. Ever since the war started, suddenly that's being in a very 1984 George Orwell way, being completely uh, expunged. Yesterday there were Nazis, that was the truth. Now suddenly there's articles in the mainstream media, that uh, London Times, CNN, uh, whitewashing the Azov Battalion in particular and saying that they're no longer Nazis, they're just ultra-nationalist. Um, so there's, there's there's certainly been this far-right nationalist uh, part of the Ukra Ukrainian state Um, and that's also what makes it very unsafe for people who don't follow the government line. It's not necessarily a stable government. Of course, it is at war, so we can understand that to an extent. But this far-right nationalist element um, is, is very dangerous. But uh, recently, Zelensky got an interview and he said, well, uh, this Nazi group, They are what they are, and some people in Ukraine find them, it's cool. Well, it, he has to say that because of the power that they have. Um, of course, NATO uh, has huge power over Zelensky. There's a few oligarchs who has huge power over Zelensky, but uh, far right and Azov has huge battalion. There's a story that he tried to go to, when he got into power, he tried to go to the front um, in the east and tried to pull back these... Um, nationalist battalions, but they laughed at him and, and told him to leave. There's the, the, that, that, the question you just asked really highlights 
just how much power the ultra-nationalists have uh, in Ukraine. And I worry that it'll get even more powerful. I, I didn't spend long in Kiev, but so I wasn't able to speak to too many people. One person I did spoke to uh, said something very interesting to me. He was anti-Russian, of course. Most of the Ukrainian government is very anti-Russian now. They're against the, the war. He said if Russia uh, attacks Kiev, he have to take up arms. And he's, <laughs> he's certainly not, I've never been a soldier. But what he also said was that uh, so many Ukrainians don't care about Crimea, don't care about Donbass and Luhansk. In Crimea, it's 90% Russian. Okay, so most people in Crimea want to be part of Russia. In Donbass and Luhansk, which I've been to before many years ago, the majority is 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 uh, is are ethnic Russians. The majority would like to be independent or part of Russian, Russia. And there's so many Ukrainians who, frankly, would take the deal of Crimea is Russian. Let the Hunt Donyats and Luhansk have their own say. Um, and so many Ukrainians would take that deal. But it's the ultra nationalists that they're the ones who will fight for Crimea. They're the ones that will fight for Donbass and Luhansk. And particularly the United States, um, there's parts of the United States who would frankly like to make Ukraine into an Afghanistan for Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Afghanistan being one of the major reasons the, of the fall of the Soviet Empire. So for my fear is that uh, NATO will increasingly give power and weapons to the hardline nationalists because they're the ones who want to fight for Crimea and uh, Donbass and Luhansk, they're the ones that will keep the war going, whereas so many Ukrainians, fr frankly, will be happy with peace and let Crimea and Don Donbass and Luhansk make their own decisions. It is remarkable that uh, Zelensky was elected in 19 with 74% against uh, Poroshenko, the previous president, and he was elected because he made campaign against the war, he promised to finish the war, even was speaking in Russian to uh, the eastern part of the country. So is he a kind of hostage of the Nazis group and, and from the USA? Yeah, I, I, I would say that's that's a fair assessment. I mean, when, when the Russians uh, invaded, his popularity is about 20%. And I think the Russians perhaps hoped that um, after the shock of uh, the attack, maybe he would fall, but that hasn't happened, of course. Now he's He's, he's become much more popular because of his his stance, um, but he was hugely unpopular. And I think, but I think in Zelensky's uh, defense, I think that was genuine. He did want to try and stop the war there. I, the same person I spoke to in Kiev, I asked him, why has there not been any peace in eight years in Donbass? Who, whose fault is that? And he said, America. And he's no, I mean, he's no pro-Russian. He's very anti-Russian. He's very. But as a thoughtful person, he blames the Americans. Um, so I think there was a desire from Zelensky to have peace, but I think the power of the Americans and indeed the ultra-nationalists um, have stopped them from, from achieving that. Mm -hmm. Do you intend to go back to Ukraine or is it possible to make journalism there? In Ukraine for myself, it's difficult. I've just applied to the Russian uh, government to go into the Russian side. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. Not many Westerners are allowed in in there, um, but Ukraine at the moment uh, it's 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 difficult. I mean, there's particularly more and more videos coming out, um, which the Western media is completely ignoring. Not just of the execution and and killing of um, torturing of Russian uh, prisoners of war, but also um, Ukrainian citizens. Anybody seen as as pro-Russian? What would you advise for the European <laughs> citizens? how to be correctly informed? I think it's important to see both sides. I read a quote from John Stuart Mill um, yesterday. He says, if you don't understand the other side's point of view, you don't really understand your own point of view either. So it's very important to see both sides, particularly as we're going into the Cold War 2.0. We've had a suppression of, of foreign media in, in the West as well. And so it's very hard to see both sides. So. We have to see how the people in, in Donbass and Luhansk feel on the Russian side. You may not agree with that, but it's important that we see both sides in order to, to look for peace. At the moment, there's, no, there's nobody calling for peace. There's nobody calling for negotiations uh, at an international level. NATO and Russia can solve this by, 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 by talking and trying to find a, a way to peace for both sides to be happy, but that's not happening. All we have is weapons being sent on one side 
and the Russians doing what they're doing as well. So we need to we need to listen to other sides of the argument. Is it important for European citizens? I mean, for uh, at economic and social uh, level, is it important the question of uh, Ukraine, or is it just? Uh... Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not a an oil and gas expert and a financial expert, but it's obviously very, very worrying. Um, I mean, it's different for Britain and for where you are in Belgium and France and Germany, Germany and Austria, particularly with their gas and oil dependency on Russia. We've all been told, including in America, that we're going to have to drop our living standards um, for this war. And I, I think increasingly as this goes on, and it's in Britain, for example, our energy prices have gone through the roof all of a sudden. I think as things go on, we're going to continue, we're going to increasingly ask whether we're being told the truth and whether this war is worth it. There is a huge poverty uh, in the USA, increasing in Europe. Uh, should the people uh, spend their money for weapons or for the? Well, yeah. I mean, you make a good you make a good argument, but perhaps perhaps that's why the propaganda is being so strong on this. Um, when there's so much homelessness and poverty in, in in America, particularly, and they're being given, I think, something like ten billion dollars. Don't quote me on that is being spent by the Ukrainian government on this war. Um, I think increasingly people are going to have to ask uh, who's profiting from this war and, and is it really in our interests. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.